In our business, we, we're mostly a beer company, but we also have a big Pepsi business in the Americas. And uh, we're the biggest Pepsi bottlers outside of the US. So we have a lot of contact with Pepsi. We exchange best practices. We visit them a lot. And uh, we've done that for almost 20 years. And every time I would come to Pepsi here in the US to visit, exchange, copy in our language, uh, I would always copy a lot of things in pricing, execution, go to market, route to market strategy, distribution. There was one manual that they would always try to hand it to me that I never really, I said, no, no, I already have too much to carry on the plane, which was a manual on leadership. It was a 57 page manual with 57 characteristics of a good leader. And in those days, you know, we we're pretty much in South America. And I said, man, this thing of leadership is too much of an American concept. You know, I mean, I mean, it's about movies, Hollywood, you know, West Point. It's not for us. You know, we do it differently. You know, leadership, I'll not carry that book. And it's funny because as I evolved, I had a, I was, uh, most of my time in the company, I've been in the head of sales. So for me, sales was everything. And I was famous in the company to say, you know what, everything else doesn't matter. I don't care. I mean, it's all about sales. If I don't sell, you don't produce. If I don't sell, you don't hire anybody. So it's all about sales. And that's what matters. Everything else is kind of back office. And uh, I was very radical. And not today. And, uh, and then my CEO at the time, the guy I reported to, told me, you know what, Brito, we're going to promote you from head of sales to head of operations. And that is people. We don't call it human resources, we call it people. Uh, manufacturing, procurement, and some, some other boring thing. And I said, <laughs> and I said wait, wait, wait a minute, I mean, my results are pretty good. OK, we're having a tough start of the year. But if you look at the last 10 years, I mean, I've had the track record. Why am I being demoted? And he said, no, 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 trust me. I mean, this is good for your career. You know, it's going to be good. You're going to be the CEO of the company one day, right? I said, well, that's my dream. And he said, OK, but then you need to learn that the company is not only about sales. That's the ultimate thing if somebody buys what you're producing. But uh, that's not all about sales. And then I went to this new function for two years. And <laughs> guess what? The, the thing that I really liked the most about it was the people side of things. And that was really when I truly understand what's behind everything I was doing in sales, which was all around this people thing. So that's how I got there. And then I called Pepsi and said, by the way, that book that I always left on the table, can you send it to me, that 57? <laughs> we, we, we simplified that a lot. Because that was a challenge, too. We, 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 you're going to see, about, I'll talk about leadership here, philosophy. And one thing we believe a lot is in being simple. You've got to do simple things, things that are easier to understand, because that has a much bigger likelihood of success and people understanding it. So when I saw 57 pages on leadership, I said, no, this is not going to work. I mean, Pepsi has been doing this for 20 years, 30, 50. This is our first year. So let's start with simple things. And the first question was, OK, are leaders born or made? That famous question, right? And you read some, some literature that says that only 2% of the population are born leaders. And I said, man, if I go with this theory, it's going to be tough. We need a whole bunch of leaders here. If I believe that only 2% of them, and if I hit the right 2%, are going to be leaders in this company. So I, as a hypothesis, I decided to go with the other theory that said that you can form and get people to be better leaders. So we started like that. And then we said, but what's a leader? And we define it very simply. A leader is somebody who needs a team to achieve his or her targets. That's it. If you are working number crunching alone, you're not in a leadership position right there because you can do your job yourself. But if you're leading a sales division, if you're leading a plant, if you're leading a finance organization, you need people to help you get there. And that's when leadership skills will play a role. And then we said, OK, but what's a good leader? And we defined, and instead of using 57 things, we said three things. Very profound things, but three things. We said leader, a good leader is all about delivering results on a sustainable basis, doing it with the team, because again, the very definition, you cannot do it alone, doing it with the team and everything that goes along with the people side of things, and doing it right. So you can replicate, you can build on top, you can do it again. If you do it wrong, you have to redo it, but go back to square one. So it's all about delivering results with the team, doing it the right way. And then you say, OK, now I understand. Leaders can be formed, can be trained. You can enhance their skills. Uh, you know what you expect from the leaders, results, team, doing it the right way. You know that in some positions you need a team. You need to be a leader. 
But what's expected from a leader? How you build, for example, in our company, the question we always had is how do you build a high-performance culture? And it's a little bit of a buzzword, but once you have a 20-year track record, I think you can look back and say, well, some of the things worked. How do you build a high-performance culture? And what we did as leaders, we learned that you have to do three things in terms of content to lead a company. First thing, you have to have a dream that you announce to the organization that's a powerful enough dream that will inspire people, motivate them, give a sense of purpose, will align people, get them to run in the same direction. That's key. You're going to be the size of your dream. We learned that time and time again. And I'm not saying this because it's a nice thing to say. It's, it's pragmatic. We learned that. And you know why we learned it? Because we learned one day, we realized that we didn't have a company. We had a collection, a group of people that we called a company. There was no such a thing as Imbad or Imbad, or for that matter, Brahma in the old days. What we had is myself and 85,000 colleagues of mine around the world, 30 countries. That's the company. And as individuals, we, we, we like to have dreams. I had a dream of coming to Stanford at once. I had a dream of having somebody financing me to come to Stanford at once, you know, in my life. I had a dream of dating somebody, buying a car, buying a house, going travel somewhere. So those things that moves you on a daily basis when you wake up Monday morning and you feel, oh, man, holy cow, it's too cold outside, and then you, you have a purpose, a sense of purpose. But some people overdo that a little bit, and they announce things to organizations that are more like adventures than dreams. Dreams are stretched by nature. You're not going to dream about something small. You know, you dream about something big. It takes the same amount of energy. That's the first limit. To dream big or dream small, to dream big or dream small takes the same amount of energy. So why not stretch it a little bit? So dream is stretched by definition. For us, dream is that kind of thing that you know 70% how to get there, and you believe that the, 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 the balance, the 30% you learn on the way as you trip over things, as you learn on the way. Adventure is the opposite. You have no idea how to get there. You just think it's a good sentence to say, we want to be this in five years. Guess what? People don't buy it because they, it's not credible. They say, hey, man, we know 20% how to get there, 80% to discover along the way in five years. I don't buy that. I'm not going to commit myself, my life to this. This is crazy. I'm going to go somewhere else. So the first thing you have to have is a dream that really inspires people, give a sense of purpose, a sense of direction. And everything else that comes from it belongs to this. If you don't buy into it, our dream, for example, in the, in the, in the different phases, was always to be the best in class in what we're doing. And we had ways to measure it, profitability, volume, growth, and all that. And that inspired people because you want to be part of a winning team. So that's the first thing. The second thing is what we call the whole people you know, issue. The realization is that when you go to the service industry, it's very, it's very easy to realize that people is the most important asset that a bank or a consulting company has. It's the kind of asset base that goes home every night in the elevator. It goes down. Your asset base goes home every night, and you just hope that the asset base will come back in the morning again to work and to keep the business moving forward. When you go to consumer goods, you tend to think that what matters is really the brands you have, the trucks, the warehouses, the plants, all the physical things you can see as a consumer. But what we realize is that behind all those things, you have, again, great people. So to have a, a great brand, that was because somebody or a group of people had the right insights, understood consumers' needs, occasions, and knew how to fulfill that on a day-in, day-out basis and knew how to execute that, the people. Anybody can build a plant, but to have a plant that churns great products, great efficiency, it's all about people, the way they manage that plant. So the asset anybody can have, it, but the software, the people, that's what matters. And we realized a lot of things about people. First, very complex animal to deal with, human beings. Very complex. We're all very complex because we want, we want it all. You want to make money. You want to be recognized. You want to be heard. You want to be part of a winning team. You want to make a difference. You want to be leading something. You want to be involved in the best part of the company in terms of growth and all that. So you want all this, and you have to manage this if you want to have the best people. It's funny because I never heard a company say, our intent is to have the very average people in the marketplace. Never heard that. I think every company would say the same. But what we realize is, is, is one thing is to say, the other thing is to practice. For example, great people, that's one thing we learn. Great people attract more great people. That's obvious. But the, the opposite learning is even more dangerous. That mediocre people attract more of the same. 
And if you're in a company, if you're leading a group, you can only be as good as your group. And if you start being you know, nice to people in the sense of, well, Mike's a nice guy, but it's not very good, but he's been here for 10 years, and, you know, well, next year we'll talk about this. You know, the people reveal this year, you know, yeah, he didn't make it, but, yeah, you know, let's give him another chance and give the feedback and all that. And then 15 years later, you're still with the same problem, and that's when you start going off track because you say you want to have the best people, you attract the best talent, but then the young talents like you are looking at Mike, a blocker, and say, man, this company is saying one thing, doing something completely different. So mediocre people attract more of the same. They like to work together. They don't challenge each, you know, each other. They, 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 they think any target will do it. Great people are different. They want to learn. They want to be surrounded by the same kind of people. You know what great people like we learn? Talented people, what they like in a company, in a company environment? They like a place where they have meritocracy. And meritocracy is tough. It's tough. It's a word that everybody would agree. Nobody would be against it. Who would say, no, I don't think meritocracy is right. I think it's seniority. You should promote people in seniority, how long they're in the company, you know? So meritocracy, they like informality, and they like candor. So simple, but so hard to execute. I always say it's the same thing. If you want to be in good shape, it's so simple, isn't it? You have to eat well, exercise, but how many of us catch ourselves sometimes not doing it? So it's the same thing about the company and about leadership. Everything is very simple, very common sense, thank God. But the difference is between the ones that do it and the ones that think they're doing it. So, uh, for example, with this mic example, in our company we think to be fair with people is to treat different people in different ways. Most companies would not be able to say that because they would say that goes against something. We recognize that in our company we have 85,000 people but 200, 250 are really the ones that make a difference. And that's, again, being pragmatic. I'm not saying it's the correct thing to, to say or not, but it's pragmatic. 250 people in our company make a difference. These people, they are managed in a different way because we want to make sure they are excited. They're not going to leave the company. They're going to grow at a faster pace. They're going to grow at the pace of their talent, no matter how senior or junior they are to the company. They belong to that group. We need to make sure that these guys are engaged and giving everything they have to grow our business. Okay, so those are a couple of things about people. Um, the other thing we, we, we like to do with uh, people is create this environment where people feel attracted and they will stay. Meritocracy is one thing I said. You think, well, that's obvious. You know, that the guy who has the best track record, most potential, should progress faster. But how many times you're going to find yourself in a company that will say, yeah, but Mike, you know, has been here for 10 years and, you know, let's give him an opportunity. You've been here for two years, so you have time. You're young. You wait. And uh, how many companies would do that? And for you making a decision, it's much, to, it's much easier to live with that kind of decision when you promote people because most people would say, yeah, that's right. Mike deserves the opportunity, you know. But what about Tom? Well, what about Jane? And pretty soon the talented people will start going away. So everything I'll, I'll tell you here today, it's so simple, it's so common sense, but it's so hard. I compare this to going to the church every Sunday. I mean, the Bible has been there for 2,000 years, and we still don't get it. <laughs> right? We have selective hearing, selective memory. So you go there, you only get that 5% that you can cope with. The other 95, you, you, oh yeah, I forgot. And then next year you go again. That's the thing about leadership. Everything is so simple, but it's so tough not to get sidetracked because there are so many distractions. People is one of those things. There's a professor that was here uh, when I was here, Jim Collins. He was a professor here. He was my professor. As a company, we've been in touch with him since 1993. And he wrote Good to Great, the book I'm sure you all know. And uh, every December, for the last four years, we go to Boulder, meet with him and the board and the whole thing. And once I asked him, I said, Jim, let me ask you this. I mean, I, I read your book. Again, it's so, so much about common sense. Why, why would any company do anything different than that? Why would any company choose to be good as opposed to be great, according to your definition and your findings? And he said, Brito, you know what? In my research, what I found is that all companies start with the right ideas. But the problem is that the good companies don't understand, or better saying, the great companies understand that it takes time, to build a great company. It's brick by brick, and it's very tough. It requires a lot of resilience. 
good companies think that there must be an easy way. There must be a shortcut. And that goes with people as well. How many companies will come here, hire an MBA, have a training program? But that's a lot of work. You have to come here, you have to do recruiting, you have to develop. You know, five years later, the guy will start giving something back to you. As opposed to some companies that says, hey, I can short circuit this process, I'll just go to the market, hire somebody from a marketing, a great marketing company, has been 10 years in the marketplace, has been formed by somebody else, I'll just bring it, you know, to join our company. I don't need to do all this training program, MBA recruiting. But guess what? These guys will come with a different culture, different mindset, and normally in our experience, it doesn't form a great team because you have people from all over with different ideas on how to run the business and different values, and that doesn't get the company to be a great company. The other thing is that, okay, so you have this dream. You have the best people that you try to attract, and it's tough. There are a lot of temptations to get up, sidetracked. And we always say you should hire people that can be better than you. Because it's, it's, it's tough, right? You ask, okay, we want to hire the best people in the marketplace. And you say, okay, how do, how do you define best people? And you say, okay, I don't know exactly how to define it, but I say, if it's better than us, it's already better for the company, right? If we're hiring somebody who, with the right training, the right opportunities, and the right time, can get to a position better than we are today, the company will be better off. So that's already a, a thing we say. And we say leaders are measured by the quality of their teams. That's important. So we have to realize that even if for, if for selfish reasons, even if you don't believe in all I'm saying, you should have a great team as a leader. Because if you do that, you're going to be able to get to your targets you know, faster, and you're going to be able to be promoted faster. Because people, when they look at you, they'll say, no, he has such a great team, so he has people to replace him or her. So yeah, it's the right time to give him a chance to, to go further. So even for the wrong reasons, you get to the same place. People are the most important. That's the only competitive advantage today we see is that. It's funny because when we did a merger in Brazil many years ago, we had an opportunity to merge with a competitor. And it's how many times you have the chance to do that in the same market? And we said, okay, why are we performing all these years much better than these guys? Maybe they don't have the processes we have. Maybe they don't have the proprietary things we developed. You know what? We got there. They had everything. Every numbered copies we had that we thought was top secret, they had it all. Everything was copied. They had it, but it was all on the shelves. Nothing was implemented. And the only thing that could explain performance, they had some brands that were even better than ours. The only thing we could put our fingers on was the kind of people that we attracted, the sense of purpose that our people had in building this great company that will be there forever and beat everybody else, and the way to do this, the shared mindset, the culture, which I'm going to talk now. One of the things that in our culture is very important. It is the idea of ownership. We believe that owners make better decisions. Why? Because they live with the consequences. That's the only reason. So whenever they do a trade-off between risks and, uh, and the decision they have to make, if they own the company, they feel like they own the company, they'll do it with a mindset that, well, I'll be here next year, 10 years from now. I always compare that to, to, to a rental car. I don't know, maybe it only happens with me. But whenever I drive a rental car, I try a lot of things. <laughs> I take all the insurance. <laughs> and I try a lot of things. You know, w w one of the things I like to try the first time was, what happens if, I, if the car is still moving forward and I stick to reverse. <laughs> Man, how many of you guys have this curiosity? Isn't that? I mean, but with my car, I never had the guts to try it. Because I say, well, what about if it doesn't work? And I have to live with this car tomorrow, and next month, and next year, and next five years. So in a rental car, why do people act differently, I think? I think it only happens with me. I'm sure you guys drive the same way. Um, yeah, going through a bump to see if you can get four wheels off the ground. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it only happens with me. But, and, uh, and then you say, well, why do I drive my car in a different way? Because that's my car. It's going to be mine tomorrow. So I'll live with the consequences of my trials. So we don't want to be a rental company in the sense that people come for a job. They come here for a job, join our company. They'll try their best. They'll try a couple things, risky things. If it doesn't work, they'll go to the next job. That's something we don't like it. That's why we try to 
have an environment in our, in our company, be it with targets, the way people participate, compensation, the whole bonus system, the whole thing, to, so people understand that we own this company. And therefore, whenever you make a decision, be aware that it's going to be your decision for, for many years. You're going to have to live with that, not the rental car that somebody else the next day will pick up the, the pieces. So. But I'm sure it only happens with me. Um, I think also ownership is a great concept for us because owners know that they have to earn it every day. I mean, if you own a bakery and the Walmart opens up in front of you and you say, man, why me? Why me? I mean, my family has been in this business for three generations. I mean, we do the best bread in, in town. We make the best bread in town. Now Walmart's selling for one-tenth of the price, one-stop shopping with a big parking lot and all that, convenient, in and out, and here I am. What about my clientele? But that's life, you know? So this whole thing about understanding that you have to earn it every day. You're not entitled to anything. To more in our business, if everybody, consumers decide to stop buying our products, we have no business. So we have to sell beer every day. We have to sell Pepsi every day. That's it. So this idea is a powerful one. It's an ownership idea. For example, in our company, we don't, have, we don't like options. We like shares. Because shares, you go up and down with the shares. You own the shares. Options, you only have the upside. That's not the ownership. Ownership is upside and downside. If you own that bakery, you're going to go with it, up and down. That's what we, it's true ownership for us. We also like, in our culture, we, we talk a lot about focus on results. Again, so obvious, but so powerful. I mean, focus. As a leader, one of the, the, the things that people look most at you will, what's on the top of your list? What are the things we need to do to succeed? And focus is very important. I remember times, I, I remember when I became a CEO uh, in 2003 of the old company. And again, always been in sales. I had that brief passage, demoted to operations, learned a lot. And uh, when I came back, uh, CEO position, I, we had a competitor of, us, uh, of ours in Brazil that took 10%, 10 of our market share in three months. We had 68% market share. All of a sudden, we had uh, 63 they did a great launch, very well executed, and we lost all the market share in three months. And the markets were all around us, investors, and say, hey, what's going on? We thought you guys had a good grip there. And, um, and I remember the, the thing that that year we failed is that that year we felt things were so good that we said, you know what? Let's try to do more things. So let's try to do more innovation, more activities in the marketplace, more promotional activities, more, 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 more. And at the end, we clocked our execution capability. So we went off. Again, that's what I'm saying. It's so simple. Focus, of course. Everybody will agree. But sometimes you think, you know what? Things are going so well. Let's do things a bit faster. So the things that we planned for next year, let's do it this year together with something else. And then we got so much the eye, the eye off the ball that we lost that. Then we re recover again. In six months, we're back. But that's the kind of learning. Focus. Very important. Leadership. Selecting the right fuse, because if you select the wrong fuse, then you're, you're, you're in trouble. But selecting the right fuse and giving people that message that, guys, these are the things that will move the needle. These are the must-haves. Everything else is nice to have, but these are the things that will make a difference. The, the other thing in, the, in, our, in our culture that, uh, that uh, we say a lot is that uh, uh, we've got to be always unhappy or let's say have a healthy dissatisfaction with our business. We think that's key. And sometimes we criticize ourselves for not um, enjoying the good moments when we have good results and celebrating because we're always eyeing the next step. But that's, you know, you talk to, to, to guys that are good in what they do in sports and all that, that's, that's what they say. You go to a tennis player who just won something and you go to the interview and the guy says, oh yeah, it was a good game, but I need to work a little bit on my serve. Or, but I was not, you know, my back hurt a little bit, so I was not in 100% shape. So I need, and the next championship will be two weeks from now, and I need to prepare, and I need to, and I need to, and I need to train. So this whole idea of never being satisfied with the status quo, again, so simple. But how as a leader, you instill that, and you get people to be always unhappy with where they stand. The other thing is that... Um, that's very uh, key to our culture is this whole thing about no shortcuts. I mean, 
we, we understand and we try to give people that understanding that we are a compliant type company. And uh, what you learn time and time again is that uh, uh, doing the things right, again, it's a pragmatic thing. It pays off. That's the kind of thing people expect from you. And it takes a lifetime for you to build those credibilities and those assets. And you can destroy that so easily with brands, with consumers, with customers. So that's the other thing. No shortcuts. You cannot build a great company if you believe in shortcuts. If you believe in the two-month diet uh, book that was new in the market, that type of thing. So, uh, and you know what? The other thing we learned, I mean, I talk about all this. I talk about having a dream. I talk about having uh, uh, the, the people, you know, being the central focal, focal point of our development as a company. I talk about this culture of ownership, hard work, focus, results. I talk about all the things about no shortcuts. But you know what? Most people don't like that. That's amazing. We go recruit in some countries. We have business in 30 countries. What we find out is that our culture is different than the national culture. So it is possible to have a set of things you believe that you call culture in China, in Korea, in Russia, in Brazil, in Belgium, Germany, in the U.S., everywhere. The national culture is different. People eat in different ways. They spend their free time with their families in different ways, and that's all fine. And that's why we travel, to see all those different ways of doing things. But when it comes to the company, we're very clear. It's one company, one culture. If you want to join us, try to understand the way we do business, the way we're trying to, to grow our company. Very basic, common sense type things. And if you agree with that, great, join us. But if not, no problem. There are a lot of other companies out there. But what we learned <clears throat> is that most people like the average company. What's the average company? The average company is the company where people are promoted, for example, more by seniority than by their track records. The average company is a company that you know exactly where you're going to be 10 years from now. Not very exciting, but you know where you're going to be. The upside is limited, but the downside, non-existent. The average company is a company that doesn't differentiate people. And the average leader is the one that promotes that. The average leader thinks that everybody should be treated the same because that won't get me in trouble. The great leader is the one that understands that different people deserve to be treated differently. I'm not talking about basic human rights. I'm talking about career opportunities and that kind of thing. Uh, so what we see as we go through all these countries where we have business is that it is very hard to find people that will be excited about the way we're trying to build a business. But once you find them, they get really connected to the company. They, they cannot work anywhere else because they love this kind of openness, candor. For example, I was talking about candor. And before I opened to Q&A, I didn't really go too much into that. So I was saying people like openness. They like to know where they stand. And that's a right. We always say in our company that the way to treat people is always to tell them where they stand. And that's so key. Think about that. Think about that Mike example. How many times do you catch yourself as a leader trying to make decisions for somebody else because you think you know what's best for him or her and you don't tell him or her what's going on? So the guy's not performing, doesn't have a bright future in the company, it's 35 years old, so can still go somewhere else, bright guy, can still start a career elsewhere, but you think you're doing a great thing for the guy but by, by keeping him in the company. And then at some point, the guy's 45, and you finally have to say, you know what, we tried for 10 years, it doesn't work, so you're, you're out, and now the guy's 45. So, I mean, we always, we always say, you have to be fair with people. Life's too short to work for a boring company or to be deceived and not knowing where you stand. So, I would say, in summary, what I learned in all these years is that uh, leadership, we started the business thinking that what mattered really was the whole thing about attracting great people and having the technical and process knowledge. We learned, uh, I'll tell you one case, last case. At one time in our company, we were having a problem many years ago of a high turnover. So he said, man, how come? We think this is the best company to work for in the world, and so many people don't agree, and they're leaving. Why is that? And we had a board member at the time that was very much into people and understood the power of people, more even than we did. And he said, Brito, you know what? If you think people is the most important thing in your company, let me tell you this. In pockets of your business, in some countries, you have a sick population. Your people are sick. 
because you have turnovers of 25%. And that doesn't build a great company. And people that are sick, they, they, they cannot get trained. They don't learn. They don't progress. They don't help the company. And that was very, very strong to me, you know, because it, when you say turnover, it's a technical name. But when you say sick, we all know what it means because it hits home. And we did an interview with all those people. I mean, people that were leaving, people that were just joined, people that were old-timers in the company. We did a thousand interviews. And what we learned from all that is that leadership is this invisible thing that was really missing in our company. That's when we, we like, called Pepsi and, and asked for their manual. Uh, because the guys were leaving the company because they're saying, you know what, this company has, doesn't offer me opportunities for growth. And that was not true. We were growing like crazy. I mean, we needed people all the time, people being from, promoted from within. But perception is what counts. And people had the perception that their future was not very bright. They, had, they told us that they were not always learning a lot from their leaders, from their supervisors. They told that they didn't understand where the company was going. And so all this boils down to good leadership or lack of it. So that's when we started realizing that more important sometimes than process knowledge and management knowledge, knowing your industry or how you process your business within that industry, is the leadership skills. You can do more sometimes, even if you go to a different industry, if you have those skills and you surround yourself with great people that will help you then on the other things you don't know and you have to learn, then the other way around. And uh, with that, I'd like to open for questions. Thank you very much. You spoke about this strong corporate culture and also mentioned that you don't like mid-Korea coming in because they have different culture. Yeah. Can you explain how you foster creativity and diversity in such a strong culture corporation then? <laughs> That's a good point. I mean, uh, our culture, as you say, or the culture I think a leader should implement in a high-performance organization is only a set of very basic things. It's like the U.S. Constitution. I mean, it's been there for 200 years because it's very basic. Because if it were too broad and too specific, it would have to be revealed all the time. So the set of things that we believe in, 10 things as we call it, the 10 principles, are so basic that we believe they can be, they're not going to deter creativity or anything. Your second point about we have a commitment with our people that 85% at least of all promotions will be sourced from within because we think that's the way to do it. Our best experience is to hire people at this level, MBA, or undergrad level, leaving school, and creating these people in our way of doing things because, again, it's hard to find people that like this kind of environment with more risk, more reward type environment. People like stable environments. We like people that like this environment. What we do from time to time, and again, it's not 100% from within, is we hire from outside. But when we hire from outside, we do a big scrutiny because this thing about culture is, what, is one of those things that takes years to get the fabric going but can be destroyed easily. And that's why we say in our company, even if somebody has a great performance, great track record, but no cultural fit, even after many sessions of feedback, this guy has to leave because the culture is what got us what we are. And I think it's not only us. It's any high-performance culture. You see, high-performance culture are very particular about the way they do things. And it's so basic, they don't want to change it. So everything I said here today, it's about common sense. But believe me, it's very hard in a corporate world to stick to it. But if you do it, in my experience, you'll build a company that has credibility, that will attract great people, develop great people. And because the company is is what the people you attract, then you, you can have a great business. Yeah. There was a question here. So you talked a lot about, now, yeah. you talked a lot about focus and attention to detail. How do you balance that with, uh, against developing a tunnel vision and either not seeing a risk that's coming your way or missing some opportunities? Sorry, how I balance that against what? Against uh, developing a tunnel vision and missing a risk that might not be in your area of focus or missing an opportunity that might be just around the corner and because you're so focused, you might have not seen it. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's not that we don't... For example, we have a soft drinks business. I mean, that was one of those days that 20 years ago we said, you know what, makes sense in that part of the business to diversify. But today we see so many opportunities in beer, I mean, in our business, especially in upgrading consumers. You know, 
that uh, we don't see why we should look at other things at this point. You're right, everything in life comes at a cost. I mean, if you're too focused, maybe you're missing out on something. On the other hand, if you look at everything, you're missing out on everything. So you have to choose. And that's one thing about leadership. Leadership, the toughest thing about leadership, apart from all the things that I told you, is that people look at you in a year for two or three decisions. That's it. If I look at my year, I can pinpoint two or three things that I was part of where I had to make a decision that was good or bad, but I had to make a decision, and that's it. Because when thing comes to you, it's because it's not black and white. It's tough. So this whole thing about judgment is key. You have to trust your gut. I mean, it's great to have numbers and all that. For example, when we do acquisitions, we run the numbers, all the scenarios, as we call it, V1, V2, V3, all the synergies and everything. But at the end, what you do really is you go there, you talk to the people, you kick the tires, you go in the market, you talk to consumers. I mean, you have to have that smell, that gut feel that this will work because you know that mergers and acquisitions and these things have a high probability because of cultural differences and all that of not working or not adding the value you expect. So I think it's all about this judgment that is required from leaders, and you cannot get away from it. I mean, because you could say, hey, I come from business school. Everything can be translated in numbers, and there's only one. I always say people, when I went to school, high school, they deceived me. I always say that. I was deceived at school, you know, because they told me that every problem comes with all the, 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 the numbers you need to resolve the problem, to solve the problem, and in life, forget it. That's not true. They made me believe that for every problem that was only one solution, that's also not true. There are many rights and many wrong solutions, especially, again, at, at, the, at our level. And the other thing they made me believe is that the best student will always be the best leader, which is not always true. I mean, the best student has a lot going for him or her, but it's, uh, and I was a good one, a good one. But uh, you see that there are many other things. For example, today I was happy to hear that the school is investing in people skills and leadership skills, because when I look back at, uh, at uh, the things I, I had 20 years ago here, subjects, there was a touchy-feely one that I didn't take because I thought it was too soft. I said I looked for the poets, right? They call it the poets. I said, no, this is for poets. I mean, this easy credits. I'm an engineer. I'll go for finance, corporate finance, and this and that and the other. And then when you go through life, you, understand, you, you, you see, you know what? Had I known some of the things I know today in terms of people and how powerful that can be, if you know how to motivate, inspire, create a great team, how much easier it is to, to get to things like that, that would be great. So long answer. I don't know. We balance well. We give people recognition for like 20 seconds, and then we go for the next challenge. <laughs> that's how. Uh, no, we balance well. I mean, uh, that's one thing you learn in sales. Uh, I mean, uh, every day is a different day. So just because I sold X amount of cases yesterday, has nothing to do with the amount of cases I'm going to sell today. So. We do celebrate, uh, not 20 seconds, but like a you know, couple of hours, and then we're already talking about the next month, the next week, the next program. But you're right. Sometimes we get, we get criticized for not recognizing enough. And um, yeah, and, and, and we say, you're right. That's one thing we need to get better. So maybe getting from, I don't know, two hours to three hours recognition, and then going, <laughs> going to the next thing. You know? <laughs> but, but it's a tough balance. You're right. Yeah, right there. Uh, I was curious to hear. About, <laughs> <laughs> I was curious to hear about what were the challenges. How was the planning and the execution to join the culture of Ambev and Inbev to make sure that all that view was conveyed through the whole organization? Yeah. Well, that that was um, that's a good question because the time was right. Because at, at Ambev, the company I come from, we had this culture that was very ingrained in everybody's mind. You know, has never changed. That's what's good. 20 years, good times, bad times, always the same. Very basic things. Interbrew, the other company, the Belgian company, that had business in Europe and Asia, they grew by acquiring existing businesses. And they didn't have a culture of its own. So they were still tolerating different ways of doing things in different countries. So when we joined, we said, hey, we have something here that works. It's not like a pilot. 
has been in place for 20 years. And they said, yeah, let's do it. So it was very easy because the timing was right. But you're right. Sometimes in mergers and acquisitions, that's a problem. For example, we have a business now that we acquired. I'm not going to say the, the country, a big, a big business. I went there before we signed the check, and I was amazed about the culture. I said, man, this is just like ours. They say everything we say. They practice everything we say. They have a whole bunch of talented people here, great. Then we merged. You know what the problem is? That culture was based in one guy as opposed to ours. Our, our, our culture is not based on me. We created a system that has a life of itself, you know, because a lot of people, you know, they share the same mindset and they know what to do. In that one company, it's all centralized at the top, and this guy says yes and no to everything, and the culture comes from him. So now we're in this process of trying to get these things uh, back to more of a system, people, other people doing, doing it and being examples. But to your question, um, we had to change a lot of people. You know, we had to change a lot of people. Because some people say, you know what, I like what you're trying to do, I respect, I understand, but I'm not up for it. I don't like it. Not for me. I understand why you're doing it. The culture, the hard work, the focus, the whole thing, I mean, the, the meritocracy, all this thing is great. I, I understand. For you to build a great company, you need all this. I'm just not up for it. So we said, okay, then we have to part ways. So yeah, a lot of that happened. It sounds like a lot of your leadership is based on you being very self-aware of how you're impacting and influencing other people. Um, and for all the people who don't have a touchy-feely class out there who are reporting up to you and your company, how do you teach them to be self-aware in the same way so that they can grow and be leaders? Well, that, that, that's a good point. Again, we learned when we had that high turnover thing I was saying that I had a problem that we did the interviews. We learned that a lot of our people were not even using the basic things we had in hand at the time, at hand. For example, we do twice a year, everybody does that, uh, performance evaluation. And ours is a 90 minute eye to eye in a room, you know, both ways, feedback both ways, and it's written. So they were not using that because at the time we were growing very fast. We're promoting people at the age of 25 to be sales leaders for 20 people at the age of 25 years old. And the guy would look at the team and say, okay, I like this people, I don't like this people, out. And that kind of thing was happening, as opposed to go back and look at the records and try to understand, now, this guy has been here for 10 years, has a track record, has some gaps, has some development programs, so let me get engaged with him, knowing all this, before I just say, I don't like the look, out. You know? So we try to tell people. We, try, we have courses now in the company, because we said, you know, there, there are two options on leadership. 25-year-old guy will be the, the supervisor of frontline people. You can either wait for five years, and the guy will learn because he's bright. He'll learn. But the cost will be so high of that learning. And we're, we're not a school. We shouldn't pay to learn. So as a business, the learning sh should come in a different way. So what we did is we, we, we started to give these people a little bit more knowledge before they got to that position. So in our company, we have programs that will get people, okay, so if you think this layer is the people that will be feeding into the next layer, Let's try to get these people some knowledge about basic, but very basic stuff about coaching, you know, selecting good people. For example, I'll tell you one example, and I love to use sports analogy. I'm not a sports guy, by the way, but I, but I think sports is great. Uh, for example, coach. Can you imagine a coach delegating the role of recruiting team members to somebody else? Can you imagine that? But you know what? In companies, that's, that's done a lot. You need people, you hire a consultant, a headhunter, and not even the last interview sometimes the guy responsible for that division will go to. They'll delegate that to somebody else. Can you imagine that in the sports? I mean, that somebody from the 49ers would delegate, okay, you go out there, you see what kind of team setup you get, you tell me, I'll just sign the dotted line, and we'll go play. I mean, can I imagine that? In companies, people do that, you know? So those details, you know? Sometimes you go to managers and they say, uh, you know, you're not spending time with informing a great team, you know. And the guy says, I don't have time. My, but people feel that it's great if they have a busy agenda because they were working a lot, you know. <coughs> but if you're not dedicating time to the main drivers of the business, which is people, you know, what, what are you doing with your time, you know? So I think the course is about this, you know. It's about bringing people 
very common sense that they would learn in five years, three years, that we learned before, telling them in advance what we expect from them and what their team is going to expect from them, from a good leader. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about establishing yourself as an MBA, what has traditionally been a relatively blue collar industry? And then secondly, how the perception of your industry as someone blue collar affects your recruiting process at MBA schools and other places? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I think uh, you're right. When I joined my company, I was the, the only, the first and only MBA to, to join the company. And uh, at first, no, nobody knew, nobody cared, you know, what the MBA was. And, and because of meritocracy, people, even the, the, the guy who hired me said, well, what, you have an MBA? All it means is that I expect more from you. That's all it means. And I expect that you're going to grow faster, but you have to earn that. Uh, today, these industries are more sophisticated. Today, even in beverage companies, consumer goods, you do have a lot of MBAs just because the business is more global. Consumers are more tough on us. They expect more. You have to have better insights, execute better in the marketplace. Otherwise, you disappear. So companies got more sophisticated, and they understand the value of talent. So today, it's not a problem. 20 years ago, you're right. It would be a little bit of a strange animal to be an MBA in a consumer goods company. Today, no. Yeah, here. You mentioned that it was important to have a dream, uh, and a simple dream, something that could be to guide people to wake them up in the morning. But then you mentioned that today's dream is to be best in class. Yes. But that also sounds like something very general and something that a lot of companies would strive to, and I'm not sure it, it actually guides people, or it would guide me to, to know what to do or you know, to be motivated. It's a morning. great question. Thank you. So, so how... Yeah. You know, no, no, that's a great point. Well, we said our dream. I, I didn't want to talk about the company, but uh, since you asked. <laughs> <laughs> we say our dream is to be the best beer company in a better world. And I'll explain both parts of the sentence. And that's measured by profitability. And we say that internally and externally because we like the pressure that that puts from the outside world, we're a public company, on us. So we say we'll always have the highest margin in the industry. And so far... We've delivered. But that puts a, 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 high, a lot of pressure on you. But you know why we do this? Just because of the people side of the equation. Because you know what? In hiring talent, you learn that people like to be connected with companies that are winning, companies that are growing, companies that are profitable, and therefore can grow, therefore can engage in projects that other companies couldn't. That's the only reason. It's great to have results and all that, but how this connects to everything else is the people side. We learned that people, most people, talented people, they like to be connected to winning teams, companies that are growing, generating opportunities for career growth, as opposed to companies that are shrinking or not having good results. So we say, in, in, in our company, we say results is what keep the, the, the people engine running, you know, going, because people like to be connected. Again, human being, very complex, but one of the things talented people like is to be connected to something that's going well, and they want to be part of it. So, uh, and we think, we always say life's too short. You want to be connected to a company that wants to do something better than the average, that wants to establish itself as the leader in its category, and that uh, wants to leave a legacy. So you want to build something that's bigger than you. That's the thing. In our company, egos are very downplayed. I mean, we don't like, uh, I mean, we don't have corporate jets. I don't have an office. I share my table with my VPs. We have open offices, and I sit with my marketing guy on my left, my sales guy on my right, finance guy in front of me, the people guy. I mean, I don't have a personal assistant. I share that with one of our colleagues. Because we always say, the leaner the business, the more money we'll have at the end of the year to share. And because our compensation system is very aggressive, I don't want to spend money. I don't have a company car. I don't care. I can buy my own car. I don't, I don't want the, the company to give me free beer. I can buy my own beer. So, <laughs> so, I mean, there are so many perks in our company, and that's another reason why it's tough to hire some people, especially when you hire not young people, but you need to hire, you know, a guy that has been 15 years in the market. Because the guy comes, and we don't have a driver. You don't have a company car. You don't have a, a, an office. You don't have your share table with everybody else. Why? Because we believe that interaction creates value. Again, it's not to be nice, 
And most people don't think that's nice. But it's, it's really because, I mean, you, you know the magic of having one table? Is that you can have 30 two-minute meetings. Make, make it possible. If you go in, the, in your calendar, in the Microsoft thing, and you try to book two-minute meetings, <laughs> the thing won't take it. It's programmed only for 15 minutes. When you sit around a table like a trading desk, our, 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 our guys came from the investment bank, so they were used to work in a trading desk. That's the environment. I mean, you're on the phone across the table. You're talking about a promotion in the Ukraine. I just came back from the Ukraine. I'll say, time, time. I, I, no, let me tell you this. I saw this in the Ukraine. You should be aware of this. And, okay, a two-minute meeting that happened right there, right there. Talk about speed, about information, about being on the same page. Some people don't like it because the trade-off. It's more noisy, you know, but the advantage is so much bigger, you know, that we do it. So transparency. Talented people like that. Mediocre people like to be behind the door. I hope they forget me. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like to be exposed. Talented people is the opposite. They like to be where the action is. They like to be exposed. They like to be part of the company's story.